Welcome to the intersection of faith and politics. This is Wall Builders Live with David Barton and Rick Green. You can visit online at wallbuilderslive.com, wallbuilders.com, and also at uh, Facebook and Twitter. You can get uh, on there and keep up with what's going on here at Wall Builders and across the country. We're doing our best to bring you some news from across the nation as well. So now on the homepage there at Wall Builders and Wall Builders Live, we uh, bring some of the latest updates. And uh, speaking of latest updates, uh, David, here we are on the anniversary of 9-11, uh, obviously a day that, uh, as uh, FDR said about December 7th, uh, went down in infamy. It's a day that I think almost every American that was over the age of, I don't know, 10 or 12 at the time remembers exactly where they were when they heard about or saw on television uh, the attacks on America. And here we are on the anniversary. It's a good time to talk about how we've done in responding to those attacks. Yeah, this is a day that has gone down in infamy. And, and by the way, for folks who don't know, because we don't teach this in school anymore, December 7th was Pearl Harbor Day. And that was an attack that went against the United States while the, the Japanese ambassadors were in meeting with the President of the United States to assure him that they were given their diplomatic assurances. As time worked out, they were supposed to have announced that, hey, we're breaking relations, and then the attack was supposed to happen on on Pearl Harbor, but they got delayed in their meeting, so they were actually meeting at the time, and and so instead of having announced to the president we're breaking diplomatic relations and then getting hit, it really was an act of treachery uh, because there had been no notice to America that we were breaking diplomatic relations. So when he called that a a day that will go down in infamy, that was what it was. It was treachery. It was disingenuousness. It was all all sorts of stuff. And this is the same kind of day for this generation. So it's not a, a good day, but it did certainly shift our paradigm of thinking. It caused us to realize that there are enemies out there, not traditional. Um, certainly at the time that World War II hit, Japanese were not a traditional enemy. Nobody had thought of suicide bombers in the sense of kamikaze pilots. That That was a mentality that didn't exist in the Western culture. Now, you know, we could understand Germans and we could understand the Italians and we could understand that side of the axis. But the the mindset that said, I will kill myself to take you out was a new one for us. And and so that that's kind of what we have found in this generation is that now we're dealing with an enemy that's not traditional. This is asymmetric warfare. It's not like going out on a battlefield and, and you know who your enemy is. It's, wow, all around you. They use non, non-orthodox stuff. They look normal active people you would never recognize them you couldn't necessarily profile them and and that's the new thing and so i think this is a great thing rick that on this day we look and see how we've done in the last 11 years against this asymmetrical warfare to which we've been uh introduced in this generation it's it's kind of like where the folks in world war ii were trying to get their brains together and get it around something that had never been done in their generation in their lifetime and that's where we are now you know, I think you you said it exactly right, and I, I'm not sure that we have mentally gotten our, our our you know a grasp on this and the difference, the different kind of war that it is. I do remember when it first happened, President Bush tried to communicate that. I mean, I thought he said it over and over and over again. He talked about how it was a new kind of war, how it was a generational war, that this wasn't something that was going to change overnight. We're such an immediate gratification society. I think maybe we expected it to be solved with us just dropping a couple of bombs. But I don't remember the president setting it up like that. It seems to me that he was clearly saying this is going to take a long time to win this fight, and it is a very different kind of fight. It is. And as you go back to a time that happened even before World War II, back in the founding era when we were fighting Islamic extremists back under the first four presidents, you remember that one of the reasons John Adams did not want to get militarily involved in that, that war against Islamic terrorists back then was he said, I, I've dealt with these guys. I've negotiated with them for years. He was the first, one of the first three ambassadors sent by the United States to negotiate with the Islamic extremists. And, and he said, I just don't think the American people have the stomach for what what we're going to face because these guys, this is a life mission for them. This is what sends them to heaven. We've never faced people that if you kill someone in treachery, it guarantees you a place in heaven. He said, I don't think Americans have the stomach, and I don't think they have the will to to fight as long as it will take to defeat this kind of an enemy. And so even back then, you know, generations before World War II, uh, when they dealt with asymmetrical warfare, they understood that it was not going to be an easy thing. And I think you're exactly right. President Bush tried to communicate that to us, but all of our experiences were with enemies that we could recognize, enemies on a battlefield we could define. And so even though he tried to tell us, I don't think people really understood that 11 years later we're still going to be in Afghanistan going after al-Qaeda and extremists like al-Qaeda. 
You know, it's interesting that that Washington and Adams both faced that same enemy, and then Jefferson comes along, and he's the one that actually does go in uh, with the boots on the ground and sends in the Marines. What do you think was different in his mindset? I mean, he had that same knowledge of of he was dealing with people that thought they had a spiritual reward for this. What was the tipping point for him that caused him to respond so differently? The tipping point for him was uh, pride. What in the world is America doing kowtowing to another nation? Where's our sovereignty? Where's our independence? We didn't fight a war of independence to be subservient to some other nation. And so at that time, he was he was paying 20% of the entire federal budget in extortion payments to Islamic groups if they would promise not to. They said, you know, if you'll give us a million dollars a year and give us three ships and give us this, this, and this, then we'll promise not to attack you. And so John Adams was willing to placate that demand, and, and he was willing to pay the money. He thought it would be cheaper than sending the military over there, and probably economically it was cheaper. But for for Thomas Jefferson, there was an attitude with it that, no, that's not liberty. We, we're not enjoying liberty, and we're not having liberty, and we're not being a sovereign, independent nation when we're letting someone else pull our strings like that. Mm. So for him, it was part of an attitude of American independence as well as the fact that it's just flat wrong. Well, it's, it's interesting that, uh, that that was the perspective because in some ways it seems like that's exactly what we're doing today. We're placating and kowtowing to and, and trying to appease the very people that, that want to destroy us. A great expert on this is Frank Gaffney. He's the founder and president of the Center for Security Policy. Uh, for years has been an expert in this area. He served uh, President Reagan. I mean, he's just been in all kinds of high-level positions dealing with this and looking at it from an international and a historical perspective. So here on the anniversary of 9-11, we thought it'd be great to get a perspective from him on how we're doing. Back in a moment with Frank Gaffney. He's our guest today on Wall Builders Live. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. Today, there are numerous documented accounts of individual students being disciplined simply for bringing a Bible to school. Fisher Ames would have been appalled at this open hostility toward the Bible. Fisher Ames was the founding father who authored the House of Representatives language for the First Amendment. In his day, he vehemently objected to any attempt to minimize the Bible at schools. In fact, he declared, why should not the Bible regain the place it once held as a school book? Its morals are pure. Its examples captivating and noble. The reverence for the sacred book that is thus early impressed lasts long, and probably, if not impressed in infancy, never takes firm hold of the mind. Founding Father Fisher Ames, the man most responsible for the wording of the First Amendment, believed that the most important school book was the Bible. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. Welcome to the Intersection of Faith and Politics. Wall Builders Live with David Barton and Rick Green. Thanks for staying with us today. Our guest, back by popular demand, Ga- glad to have him back, Frank Gaffney. He's founder and president of the Center for Security Policy in Washington, D.C. Frank, good to have you back. Pleasure's mine. Thanks for having me. Man, first time I heard you speak was almost, well, not quite 20 years ago. I, I, was, uh, I was a little younger. We were both a little younger. I was at a candidate school, actually. Uh, Morton Blackwell had put on uh, huh. from Leadership yeah. Institute, and you came over and and spoke, and uh, I was uh, mesmerized then, and have been following you ever since, and have had the pleasure of interviewing a couple times uh, here on Wobblers Live. But really appreciate you coming back on, man. We we, we just kind of wanted to get an update. I mean, here we are, September 11th. Uh, the, you know, what? Where do we stand in the war on terror? What's the status, and 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 how do you kind of size up where we are? Well, let me start by saying I don't think of it as a war on terror. Uh, and and since we have been pursuing it as such, I, I think that helps explain why it hasn't gone so well. Yeah, it is a war in which terror is used as a as a technique to try to accomplish a larger purpose. That larger purpose is trying to compel us to submit to what uh, those who have this larger purpose, uh, which they call Sharia. Uh, what they have in mind. And uh, unfortunately, the reason I think we're not doing so well in this is uh, when, when we've been chasing around after this, this tactic of terrorism, um, we've been missing the fact that at least as dangerous a threat to our country and our 
our constitution and our form of government and our way of life is a is a stealthy kind of jihad uh, that is aimed at, at subverting us from within um, by our own hands, as it happens, uh, but not necessarily through violence, but through a sort of steady erosion and and uh, and insinuation of Sharia. So, because we haven't really gotten what the war is about right. And because we are not looking at a big facet of the way it is being conducted against us, I think here we are, 11 years on, just about, um, actually having made uh, not only insufficient progress, but having lost ground Mm -hmm. in important respects. And and a lot of it is just the framing of the debate itself and the issue by not really grasping what... We're up against, and and you know of, of of what you speak, sir. I mean, you you were nominated by President Reagan to be Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Policy. You've dealt with this stuff at a high level, looking at the world at large and how to secure America and what what those attacks against us are. And they're not always in your face nuclear type threats. In this case, you're talking about a, a long term war that the opposition gets it. They they understand that it's these little seeds they can plant. And this uh, this 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 long term erosion of confidence in, in our system itself that can destroy us. Yeah, and and you know this sounds uh, either bizarre or unlikely um, unless you look at something like what's happening in Europe. We're very much the same kind of uh, well, the Muslim Brotherhood calls it civilization jihad has been waged with effect for years now, and as a result, they're they're much further down the tubes than we are uh, in many respects. But let me just give you one example, and, I, and I'll tie it in with what happened at the Republican Convention happily. Uh, the, the problem is, as one example of this civilization jihad in our own country, we've got uh, people who are trying to get our court system to uh, allow the use of Sharia to adjudicate disputes uh, here in the United States, we did a study at the Center for Security Policy found in, in just at the appellate, state appellate level, 50 cases where that was attempted. And in 27 of those cases, in 23 different states, the court actually upheld the use of Sharia, often at the expense of the constitutional rights of, uh, of women or children or women and children in, in various matters. And here's the thing. There have been in four states around the country now laws adopted uh, under the rubric of something called American Laws for American Courts. And it's it's a common-sense approach that simply says we're not going to use any foreign law, not just Sharia, but any foreign law where it violates our constitutions. And the, the, um, the Republican Party platform adopted that principle as something that they stand behind. That's a very important step, and I, I hope will help us. Uh, stave off this stealth jihad, at least in that respect. That just seems, like you said, it's just common sense. American laws for American courts not opening the door to any international law. Uh, right. tr- Trump and our, our, our law, and that's really what, I mean, if you allow Sharia law in the court, you, you almost have to trump the Constitution and our laws in order to do that. You do, and, and you know, that in and of itself is anti-constitutional because, of course, the, the sixth article of the Constitution says it's the supreme law of the land. You start putting something else in the system, and all of a sudden it isn't. And that's the worry here. Uh, Frank, i got to take a very quick break. When, when I come back, what want to find out from you, what's the right way to define what we're up against, and then what can we do to win this war? Frank Gaffney, our guest, back in a moment on Wall Builders Live. This is David Barton with another moment from America's history. It is a definite biblical teaching that every individual will answer to God for the stewardship with which he was entrusted. Previous generations therefore realized that not only would each of us answer to God for how we handled our life and our family and our possessions, but also for how we handled our country. Consequently, voting was considered an act for which we were directly accountable to God. As Samuel Adams explained, let each citizen remember at the moment he is offering his vote that he is executing one of the most solemn trusts in human society for which he is accountable to God and his country. 
he should then appeal to his conscience that he has not trifled with that sacred trust. Voting is a serious responsibility for which Christians will answer to God. Therefore, make sure that you vote and vote biblically in the upcoming elections. For more information on God's hand in American history, contact Wall Builders at 1-800-8-REBUILD. We're back. Thanks for staying with us. Frank Gaffney, our guest from the Center for Security Policy. Hey, Frank, what's y'all's website real quick so we can give it out to folks? Well, I want to give you two, if I may. You bet. Because uh, the answer to the question you posed just before the break is uh, involves the second one. The, the main uh, website for the Center for Security Policy is uh, pretty easy to remember. It's securefreedom.org. All right. Securefreedom.org. And the second, and the second one? The second one is uh, is about a course that we've offered to try to answer this question as to what's the nature of the threat we're facing uh, from these jihadists, and what can we do about it? And you mean that, we, you mean we can't we can't answer that in just a five minute segment? What's, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to give it my best shot, but I just want to give people who want to drill, drill down a little bit deeper Muslim Brotherhood in America dot com, mm. and they'll they'll get uh, they're a free online video-based um, eight-hour course that will really answer the question for them. I, I'm so glad you did that because I was actually kind of kicking myself as a, we went to break there going, I just ask a question that there is no way to answer in, in, in a, a day, let alone in, in five minutes in a, in a segment. I didn't even realize you had this. So this is an eight-hour course. This really digs deep then into it what does. we really face and how to win. It does indeed. So how do you it, summarize that in just a few minutes? Well, what, what, what? In, in, in just a few minutes, here's how I'd put it. Time and time again, our country and other freedom-loving people have been assaulted by folks who adhere to one ideology or another, totalitarian supremacist ideologies, whether it's fascism or Nazism or communism or now uh, what what its adherents call Sharia. Uh, Islamism is another way to describe it. Um, people who are trying to impose, and I'm, let me just hasten to say, not all Muslims subscribe to this, let alone want to actually force it on everybody else, but those who adhere to Sharia do. And, and Ronald Reagan had an interesting turn of phrase, and, and this sort of summarizes the challenge, it seems to me. Back in 1961, he said, freedom is never more than one generation from extinction. It, we don't pass it to our children in the bloodstream we have to fight for it, we have to protect it, and we have to uh, give it to them to do the same. Uh, or we will spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it was like to live in the United States when men were free. And that's what I would define as the problem now. We're facing a generational challenge just like that. It's got the patina of religion to it, which makes it much harder. But fundamentally, Sharia is about power, not faith. And there, that's what makes it seditious and something we can prosecute and defeat, not something we have to protect and respect under freedom of religion. Are you, are you convinced that that the state efforts on, on these American laws for American courts, is that one of the best place, places for the average citizen to weigh in? I think it's a hugely important place for them to weigh in. Uh, it, each of these turn out to be teaching moments where these uh, – these laws are debated in the various state legislatures. Um, I would also commend to them Part 10 of our course, and I really hope that they will get through the other nine parts, but Part 10 gives them a, a really very practical guide in three different ways they can help. One is individuals, two is members of groups, and three is as citizens of this country as a, as a people. And in each way, we, we at each of those levels, we talk about specific practical things that can be done, and, and I, I certainly think American Laws for American Courts is one of them. If your state is not one of the ones that's adopted it, and that's Kansas most recently, Tennessee, Louisiana, and Arizona, um, get in touch with us at securefreedom.org. We'd love to connect you with other people in your states who are working on this who would like to make sure that your rights are not uh, adversely affected by people trying to bring Sharia into your state courts. It sounds like Frank, tell me if I'm wrong on this, man, but it sounds like that in this war, 
the 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 average citizen is is just as important as the soldier on the battlefield. We've all got to fight in this thing, and and it's not just dealing with with uh, you know tanks and that sort of thing. We're dealing with propaganda, and we're dealing with legislation here in our own country. Everybody's got a role to play. You bet. The, the, this war is being fought on the home front, and the point is, it's not just being fought through violent means. There are these really, I think, the best way to describe them is pre-violent means, and you know for that reason, there's absolutely a role for the citizens of this country. And in fact, if, if they don't fill that role, well, as Ronald Reagan put it, you know, they will spend their sunset years telling their children and their children's children what it was like when they had the option to defend America and keep it free. Yeah, no doubt about it. It's 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 not just a, you know, a right to fight for this sort of thing. It's a duty. I mean, we've got a responsibility to make sure we are passing freedom to our kids and grandkids intact and this is our this is the fundamental threat to our generation this battle right here i couldn't agree more well the websites again frank so securefreedom.org is your main website for the organization that's the center for security policy does great work by the way folks not only in terms of informing us as citizens they do a great job of equipping and informing our legislators, the state and the federal level as well. So support them. Go make a contribution at their website. And then get this information, MuslimBrotherhoodInAmerica.com. Get the course. Do your homework as a citizen. It's our job to study these things so we know how to vote, but we also know how to let our voice be heard in this battle within our communities and our state and our states. Frank, God bless you for what you do, brother. Keep up the great work. We look forward to having you back soon. I can't wait. Thank you so much. Man, what a treat, David. I tell you what, that's actually, and, and from my perspective, that's an honor to have Frank. I tell you, this guy is so good on these things, and that's the kind of stuff that will help get us educated. Thrilled to be able to share uh, his program that folks can go take online for free. If they want to get educated and study these things, they need they need to start doing those. Yeah, for sure. And I want to pick up on something he was talking about, about how that we are starting to resist the, the Sharia encroachment that's coming in. You know, he pointed out 27 cases, 23 states where they've actually used Sharia and courts have upheld the use of Sharia uh, often against specific constitutional standards. And he was talking about that there is this kind of pushback. Some call it American laws for American courts. Uh, recently, a few weeks ago, I was in Tampa. I was one of, of the, the Republicans that was sent there to do the National Republican Convention. And specifically, I was chosen to be on the platform committee. There's two folks from every state to write the, the Republican platform. And I am very definitely characterized as a conservative. If you doubt that, look up any national news service, and they'll put me out there as a really kind of radical right-wing conservative. And for them, I am probably a radical right-wing. For everybody else, I'm kind of middle middle of where America is. But nonetheless, in that, and, and, and let me also say, I, I choose Republican Party not because I'm Republican, but because of the closest to the constitutional conservative principles I have. And we've talked on other programs. I go in and campaign and help Democrats as well if they have conservative constitutional principles. So I happen to be at the Republican convention, happen to be one of the folks riding uh, that platform. And Frank mentioned the Republican platform had just come out on it. So let, let me just read what we crafted there in, in Tampa. This is, this is part of what it says. It's called American Sovereignty in U.S. Courts. It says, subjecting American citizens to foreign laws is inimical to the spirit of the Constitution. It is one reason we oppose U.S. participation in the International Criminal Court. There must be no use of foreign law by U.S. courts in interpreting our constitutions and laws. Nor should foreign sources of laws be used in state courts adjudication of criminal or civil matters. It says, just as George Washington wisely warned America to avoid foreign entanglements and enter into only temporary alliances with other nations... We oppose the adoption or ratification of international treaties that weaken or encroach upon American sovereignty. Now, as it turns out, I got to write the last part of that. So that that thing that we're talking about is, you know, here I am. You know what that tells me is that tells me just how conservative the Republican convention was and that I'm allowed to write in language like this and everybody else agrees with it and votes for it and it gets ratified by the entire Republican assembly on the floor of the convention. So this is a fairly firm statement by at least one political party that Sharia, we don't want encroaching into our courts. We don't want coming into our lifestyle. And, and I love I love the phrase that Frank used in, in describing this. He said, you know, he says Muslim Brotherhood calls it civilization jihad. And I thought that's interesting because cultural jihad, we've been fighting for a number of years against liberals and socialists and progressive but this is not cultural. This is civilization. We're talking Western civilization as we know it. This is a jihad. They're fighting every aspect, which means not just on the battlefield, but in the courtrooms, 
in the educational classrooms, in religious liberty, in everything that goes on, it's a it's a jihad against every aspect of our civilization. So the the fact that we've been able to at least start pushing back some, and at least we have a body in the nation who says, hey, we don't want to go here. We want to preserve American exceptionalism. I think that that's a good pushback to what Frank has been pointing out, that we really have not done that well in the last 11 years in fighting this stuff. Well, I'm really glad to hear you say that, bro, because that, that that's a much more optimistic outlook than, than I've had. Because if you think about it, that body you're talking about, you got two major political parties in the country, and you're talking about, what, I don't know, 10,000, 12,000, however many people were there at the convention that represent the most active, the most involved people in, in politics in the, in the nation. So of those, you know, you got those two parties, you got about that same amount of people on both sides, and one half of them are saying, hey, we understand this, and we're in for the long haul, and we understand what's at stake. So that's good in terms of where the people in the nation are. Thanks for listening today, folks. Thanks to Frank Gaffney for joining us. You've been listening to Wall Builders Live with David Barton and Rick Green.